Miller and I co-chair the Sunday Morning Forums. We welcome and thank you for supporting Sunday Forums. For over 50 years at First Unitarian Society in Milwaukee, the Sunday Forum Lecture Series has showcased speakers of interest. Forums are one hour in length and provide a presentation followed by questions. Scheduling and hosting these weekly programs is accomplished by volunteers. The presenters do not receive honoraria. The content of each forum may not always align with the viewpoint of First Unitarian Society Milwaukee. They are meant to offer topics which can be pursued further independently. Before we begin today, I would like to remind you that next Sunday, February 13th, our topic will be Signs of Life in Estabrook Park with Andrew Dressel, naturalist and photographer, presenting and sharing his wild bird and life photos. And today we welcome Susan Semensky Biatia. She will be introduced today by me, but the host who invited her and helped have her with us today couldn't be here and that's Christian Becker. So somewhere today when you do your gratitudes, uh, thank Christian for having us together today. Susan will talk about the exciting times of protest in her artwork and her life, and, and we'll find out what you can do to help expand uh, positivity in Milwaukee and the state. And uh, when this poster came up, I had to say that I just want to say, and this is what democracy looks like. So um, this is what democracy looks like. Go for it, Susan. Thank you for being with us. And thank you for inviting me. And this came about because I did a similar talk for the elders group at River West Artists Association. And some folks from the UU group were there and they were pretty excited about it. Um, unlike a lot of the, pre well, that presentation, I did not have slides because I thought it was gonna be just a discussion with people. So I'm excited today to show you some slides of artwork. The, a lot of people at the River West Artists Association wanted to know how I got started doing political artwork. And they wanted to know about my childhood. And so um, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York in, um, the in a housing project in government housing that was built after World War II to house veterans during the housing shortage. And it was a neighborhood where the majority of people were Jewish and refugees from first the pogroms and then the Holocaust. Yiddish was my first language and education was the route to a better life, the accessibility to public education was a very important thing because it wasn't the way things were back in the old country, uh, which in my family was Basarabia, which is now part of Ukraine mm -hmm. and still remains, of course, a place of uh, ethnic cleansing and antagonism and war. I came to Wisconsin in 1986 but I left New York in 1973 after I finished going to nursing school. I got a scholarship out of first or second grade to the Brooklyn Museum Art School. Mm -hmm. I traveled on the subway by myself at age seven mm -hmm. and got lost a few times. But uh, I won a scholarship out of elementary school and it became uh, predict, predicting what I would do with my life. It was this talent, it was treasured, it was recognized. When I was in second grade, I won um, the International Brotherhood Week prize from the UN for a poster that I made of people in ethnic costumes from all over the world. Um, I had a copy of the World Book Encyclopedia and my mother sold it door to door. And so looking at the people in the costumes page was my favorite thing. 
<laughs> uh, then I went to the High School of Music and Art in New York, which was an hour and 45 minutes on the subway each way. Kind of cut into my social life. But it was a highly competitive and really interesting way to go to high school. And I got to try all kinds of artwork there. I learned art history uh, and met people who were not part of the immigrant communities, um, commu the, the, the poor, the new immigrant, the people who were struggling. I met people from all walks of life at that school. And I also got to leave the neighborhood because a lot of people never left the neighborhood. And I became familiar with all parts of Manhattan. And I should say too that I grew up with my artwork being encouraged by my family and my community and spent a lot of time at the wonderful museums. So my education was, was both formal and informal and it became a normal part of my everyday life. When I was in my, I, first I went to college at Brooklyn College and majored in uh, theoretical mathematics and chemistry for starters. And I was recruited into uh, one of the first honors programs out of high school. And it was a time where I was supposed to be uh, using math and science to get US to the moon first during, during the uh, Cold War. And as soon as I realized that I was part of the being recruited into the military industrial complex, uh, politically aware as I was after the Cuban Missile Crisis, where most of my high school joined the Student Peace Union, an anti-nukes group, I was appalled and didn't particularly like the math and science that I was being uh, sent into. And went reverted to my art, which was uh, studio art was considered something that wasn't supposed to be part of my special education program. My best friend also did so and majored in modern dance, but we didn't get kicked out of the program. Mm -hmm. But we were considered special students and I'll talk more about that later. So this is my contemporary period. And in the last 20 years, I've done more artwork than the rest of my life because political art is no longer forbidden. For the majority of my life, political art and art that had a message or a story or even just a narrative was uh, considered not really the center of the art world. I grew up in the world of abstract expressionism. And I was being trained as an abstract expressionist in college and you will see what happened. That didn't <laughs> last very long. I just... <laughs> Ridiculous and sin. Um, With my uh, iron miner. You're coming in and out. Uh, Susan, your youth in the UP and family, the Beatles. You can hear me okay? Not so well. Does someone know what might help that? On my back? Yes. You are now, but you're a little um, frozen. Bruce? Are you there? Yes, I'm here. I don't know what to do with this except um, to have Susan contact her family member. Here's something from I Anne. Batiza. Here's something from Anne Batiza. Um, if you turn off your video your audio will come through better. But I don't know, then you wouldn't have the, um, the artwork. Bruce? 
Let's try it and see. It okay. may uh, okay. just uh, get rid of her face, but she, the screen sharing may still work. Okay. Hello? Are you here with us there? Uh, oh. Here I come. Okay. Could you hear can you hear me? Yes. We yes. can hear you. We can't okay. see you. Well, I just got a, a glimpse of you. So yeah, we, oh, we, okay. can, we can see your face, Susan, but not your share screen. So oh, okay. try, Let's try that try again. Share screen again. Okay. Are, okay. We're going to share a screen and there we go. And we're going to go back to the top. Okay. Sorry um, for that. Internet connection problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Much, much improved. Thank you. Okay. Oh, look at that. We have a whole new configuration now. <laughs> All right. So start your slideshow. Okay. So here we are 10 years ago now. And by that time, I, were, I was working for MPS as a school nurse and I'm in the teachers union. Fast forward, because I couldn't make a living doing political artwork, short and sweet. So I did a series of drawings and a graphic nonfiction article for a magazine that I work with, which is World War III Illustrated Magazine out of New York. And it's a group of artists and strangely enough, Art Spiegelman, who we've heard of a lot recently for his wonderful book, Mouse, is part of a loose member of our group. So you can kind of get an idea of who's involved with that. So this was for a story about the Wisconsin uprising that was published about nine years ago. And in my drawings, you will always find real people who I know. Mm -hmm. And you will probably know some of them too, because this is Debbie Davis, who you will see in oh, Milwaukee yeah. as the Statue mm -hmm. of Liberty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's the pilot who was uh, landed on the Hudson, the co-pilot. And it's drummers from Riverside High School Drum Corps and Stephanie Bloomingdale's children, Stephanie, the president of AFL-CIO, as well as Micah MacArthur, our neighborhood River West plumber. I also do artwork for the teachers union and sometimes to illustrate rethinking schools but I do artwork for a lot of other groups. My first experience with seeing political artwork was the famous Bread and Puppet Theater, who marched during the very early days of the anti-war movement and the no, the no nukes movement. And I went to the workshop and helped make some of these faces. When I was in art school, I was assigned to a to an individual tutor, and my tutor was Ad Reinhardt, who is a very famous abstract painter who paints black on black. That's me, fair representation of my portrait, and Ad Reinhardt critiquing my paintings. Hmm. And then um, I went in on a college trip to Amsterdam. I went to Europe and I ended up in Amsterdam and traveled with Adinka, who's in the foreground, who is working on a continuous drawing from Amsterdam to London, and was hanging out with the, the anarchist youth movement, the provost, who brought art and poetry into the streets. And I realized that not all artwork had to just be in a gallery, and the hopelessness that I felt about doing abstract paintings 
as a 17 year old, 18 year old woman in the New York scene, uh, that could be a long story in itself. I just felt that that was not gonna be a successful venture. And I realized that artwork could be socially interactive and that it could be part of a movement for social change and reclaiming the streets and reclaiming putting culture outside of the gallery and a place that was controlled by a very elite class uh, was a possibility. So I came back to New York and got a job with the radical newspaper, The Guardian. And at this point I was a college junior. So I was going to school and I was working and I started out by just doing proofreading. And then I convinced people at The Guardian that I was capable of doing a lot more. <laughs> they doubted it because I was like 19 and I looked like I was 12. <laughs> and I was a chubby little girl from Brooklyn. And in six months I was doing the covers. I just believed that I could. And I was the only person in the art department who, could, who had a, an art background. The other people were doing the layout. Um, and we had a wonderful woman, um, Liz, who developed the film and managed the photography. But otherwise, as most of us are, it seems of your, most of you are my generation or around my generation. So you realize, of course, there was no internet. Research was, research was a whole different story. So my reference material was extremely limited. When I moved on from The Guardian and began to work with the underground press and the movement, and this was done uh, I was invited by the Yippies to do a poster for a bee-in in Central Park. When women, women took over an underground paper called The Rat that was started by fellow SDS members, but the men didn't allow the women anything to do other than make the coffee and make their boyfriends happy. And at a certain point, women at the beginning of the second wave of feminism decided that we were more capable than we were allowed to be. And women took over the newspaper, The Rat. And this is a cover I did for that. And it was a women's collective. Uh, we decided that we, once we had, were allowed to do one issue of the paper, we just didn't give it back. And it was that the rest was history. This is a cartoon I did about that period that was published in World War III Illustrated. And it was about, this was about the action after the famous uh, action at the Miss America pageant. There was a feminist action at the bridal fair about being consumers. And I promise not to obey where people were not just second, second uh, wine folks. And it was very controversial. So at that point, after I did artwork for those papers, uh, I went to Baltimore, did not do artwork for a whole period of time and was mainly a political activist. I was a nurse and I got involved with changing the way that women give birth in America. Mm -hmm. I was a public health nurse and helped organize public health nurses to resist the, uh, the powers that be in Baltimore when the mayor ordered the public health nurses to collect the trash when the sanitation workers were on strike and other such capers. I moved to Baltimore when my husband went to college at University of Maryland and walked away with all the writing prizes and was recruited by grad school in Milwaukee. And there again is Debbie Davis, who somewhere heard that I could make puppets. 
which isn't exactly true. She asked me if I could make equestrian horse puppets for stilt walkers. <laughs> and it made me go in a whole other direction with my artwork. It was the first artwork I did in Milwaukee. And so during the US involvement in Central America, we made the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse for equestrian stilt walkers. And there we are with mm -hmm. Debbie and Leona and my husband Paul helping them onto their horses. We continued with activism in Milwaukee. And there we are long ago along the Humboldt, the, the Humboldt, ah, the Humboldt Yards. People remember the Humboldt Yards? Mm -hmm. And there was a movement in River West to stop the construction of the, the Jewel Osco store, which was short-lived. And there we are. And Jennifer Morales started doing these like branches, walking branches at it. There is a drawing of River, River West and one of my, my, one of my comic strips, my non-comic comic strips, was about people in River West fighting the construction along the Humboldt Yards. We wanted it to remain parkland. People in River West fought this for about eight years and we finally won in court, but it was too late because the stores were already built. There were all these Jewel Osco people and they were all wore these uh, ominous trench coats. It was the style. It was a whole <laughs> herd of them. And there in to the left, notice that there is uh, the heron. There's a heron scoping them out. And that's a heron puppet that I made together with my son, Smitty. And that is Smitty who did not mind dressing up and, <laughs> and at, at various occasions. At that point, I got involved with the no pipelines and I'm sorry, the no mine movement against the Crandon mine. I was invited to be a medic for direct actions up north. And I didn't really feel comfortable being a medic for, for possible, um, for people getting seriously hurt in the woods. But I thought that it didn't need to go that way it didn't need to go the direction of the armed standoff of Native Americans at the mission mm -hmm. that happened in the 70s. And I got involved and did artwork for that movement. And that was the first time I worked with Native Americans in Wisconsin and learned a whole lot. So on the right, you see the mining corporation who wanted to mine zinc and copper right next to the Wolf River. And there, there's the mining co corporation saying Eureka and the people who live along the Wolf River and see how beautiful it is on the left. And there was a whole lot of artwork that came out of that movement. We made puppets. We mm -hmm. made flat puppets of Tommy Thompson. And he has a pitcher with cyanide to pour into the rivers. And we made gravestones, the coalition, the Wolf Watershed Education Project designed, uh, did the research of rivers that were, that were poisoned by mining. They each look sort of like that. And we won. Hmm. After all those years, 28 years of working against mining, the coalition of rural communities and tribes and environmentalists came together in Wisconsin in a historic way. And that's how I used to look. And I'm at the um, Mole Lake, Sakagan Chippewa reservation at a celebration and all the tombstones to the dead rivers were replaced by the victory with the wild rice mm -hmm. on, the, on that. And then did we stop there? No. So there I am as a school nurse at uh, Bayview High School, painting a mural to be part of an art show 
called Seeing Green at Woodland Pattern Gallery. And there's the mural, 28 Years of People Power. And those are re real people who are all involved. So I use the real people to tell the story. There we are at the way it was when it was installed. And that was some years ago now. <laughs> but the graphic from the No, the no uh, Crandon Mine story became the No Pinocchi Mine poster. And the Pinocchi Mine is up by uh, Lake Superior. It's in, it was in Ashland County. And it was next to the Bad River Reservation where the pipeline line three is being contested right now. And this was on a t-shirt that became very popular. There's Ben Yahola in Oklahoma wearing the t-shirt. So the artwork I do, as you'll see more and more, I make it for one thing and it's, it's prescient, prescient, prescient. Um, it can get used for lots of other things. So I make artwork for a banner and it becomes a t-shirt and it becomes a comic strip and then it hangs in a gallery. And so political art is no longer taboo. It's no longer considered lower, lower art, commercial art propaganda as it once was. And so the current period is absolutely wonderful for me. And here we go, Janine. Got involved with a group of wonderful people, Janine and Ann Steinberg and Eric Hansen and others, when we saw that trains carrying Bakken crude oil were coming right through the center of Milwaukee and over the where the rivers join and go into Lake Superior. So here we are directly south of the post office and the bridge that crosses the place where the rivers come together. <laughs> we learned about the terrible train accident in Lac Megantic, Quebec, where crude oil in trains exploded and destroyed the whole downtown of that city. And we had organized an event called Convergence at the Confluence. And we went, we went to the very first art build in Milwaukee. An art build is an event where different groups come together and make puppets and banners and do silk screening and here is the beginning of the giant heron mm -hmm. with Anne and Kim, Kim um, Kozier mm -hmm. and some propaganda that we made at the time. There is the uh, blue heron, very large. And there's the blue heron today. And it lives up by uh, Menominee Marinette where it's in rural parades against the back 40 mine that would pollute that river, the Menominee River on the border of Wisconsin and Michigan. Beautiful photo by Eddie Daniel and a windsock oil train. This is the art fields where we make banners. We project from an LED projector onto the cloth and trace it and then paint it. And that's one of the art builds. The group went to, there's Brian Chu, part of the group. And we did what's called a Cantastoria. And our group painted these flip banners to, at the um, energy fair. Mm. And there we are telling the story of the oil and where it goes and come, here it comes to Milwaukee. Hmm. We put, uh, I put LED lights, worked with the Overpass Light Brigade and Melanie Arians, who's the artist in residence for the Milwaukee Water Commons, 
lent me her lights and we lit up first the, the heron and then these fish. And these are, and Eric Hansen helped me know what are the fish that are important in our waters locally. The fish traveled up to Menominee World and were part of the marches in the cold of winter along the Menominee River to protect it from the back 40 mine. I also work with Voces de la Frontera mm -hmm. and do mm -hmm. again, I, all of a sudden when I stopped doing artwork in the 70s and into the 80s, I had always wanted to be able to do portraits that look like people. And when I came back to doing artwork when I lived in Milwaukee, all of a sudden I could. I don't know. Uh, I was the court artist for Channel 4 at some interesting trials. And I was able to draw people and, they, and, the, and it looked like them. There is the evil Sheriff Clark. And we called on him to resign and he became history. It was a happy moment. And I really enjoyed this photo of one of the Voces activists, the good guy with the cowboy hat and the bad guy with the cowboy hat. 287G was the law that would have uh, um, allowed the, taught the police and the sheriffs to become uh, accomplices with ICE in deporting people. And Milwaukee did not let this happen. Here's a banner with that same logo that became a logo that was used by <laughs> Yes, who was the group of uh, Bose's youth group and on shirts during a sit-in. And then I went back to artwork. I'm gonna go through things quickly here so we have time to talk a little bit more. I learned about the sturgeon and went up to New London to see the sturgeon run in the spring. And they're incredible. And they are really important to the Menominee tribe and to the uh, Ojibwe's. And that became a silk screen and a banner. And then collaborated with another artist who does designs for tattoos kind of art. And she did the snake head and I did the rest. And what I've been doing lately, among other things, is I travel to the different places where the pipelines uh, were being resisted by the, the uh, communities on the sites. So I went to the Mackinac Straits, where they want to build a, a new pipeline to replace the six, now 69-year-old 69 pipeline under the Straits. And it's uh, carrying crude oil from uh, Alberta, tar sands in Canada and in Canada, um, but goes through the US to go back to Canada. And contrary to what they say, the Enbridge people say, the oil is not for us, it's for export. It goes back to Canada and for export. That same image became no line three, which is the line in Minnesota and it's now become no line five. And the sturgeon were added to the Wolf River to the same image celebrating the victory of the, against the Crandon mine to now fighting against the, uh, the new back 40 mine. So it continues and we keep on fighting, but we have some victories because we closed the Crandon mine and we stopped the Pinocchio mine. We must protect the Great Lakes. And this is from a comic strip called Water Protectors. And so is this. So last, last summer, I was invited uh, to apply to make a, a boat float for the um, Milwaukee Water Commons. Uh, boat parade on the Milwaukee River. So this is what I submitted. 
and won, won the grant and built, in addition to the fish, I started making uh, blue herons. And there's the blue herons that were in the parade. They're now on exhibit, or one of them is on exhibit at uh, the Jazz Gallery. When we took the boat down the, the river, there was a real crane along the shore. And the real crane got really, really nervous. So I guess my, the cranes and the, um, sorry, the herons that I made had the right outline. I still do odd and sundry prints and stories. And this one that I made in Milwaukee about um, for a campaign that was entitled Capitalism Breaks My Heart. This was posted just uh, a few months ago all over Portland, Oregon. And it was also all over Berlin on the walls. So artwork that's made for these different issues is uh, copyright free for people who will use it for sy sympathetic issues. And you saw that um, this was done recently for someone who's an artist, Aaron, who is doing a painting of this. Here's no line five. And I will end there. So we have a few minutes for questions and discussion. Excellent, excellent. I just want to say too that I curate shows. And Nicholas Lampert, who who's part of the Just Seeds Collective and teaches at UWM, Nicholas and I curated a show in, 19, in 2000. 2000 was a watermark, as you could say, for political art in the US and North America. And we curated a show after the anti-globalization demonstration in Seattle, where a network of political artists developed. And we curated a show called Drawing Resistance. And that art show included artwork that was contemporary at that, at that time. And the show traveled without any budget to 32 cities and 32 shows across North America and, and US and Canada. Um, and it was done relay race style where whoever had the artwork had to get it to the next city. So the artwork was made to be able to pack up into a minivan and travel. Mm -hmm. And it was just an incredible experience. Um, it crossed the US, board, US Canadian border four times. And the artwork in fact did go back to the artists at the end of the show. And people lent the artwork on trust and collaboration and unity. And it was an incredible show. So the idea of sharing and collaborating has come to a point, a wonderful point at this, at this point in history. So go ahead with questions. Thank you, thank you. I just want to thank you very much, Susan. I think when we think about the times and all the changes and that you were there, I think it's, it's just an example of how you were there where you needed to be and you made it all happen. So I thank you very much. And there's probably people with lots of memories and ideas and questions. We have one now from Ann Batiza. Ann, go ahead. Well, um, hi, Susan. Thank you so much. Um, marvelous, absolutely marvelous. Um, I was recently given a rating of news media, which um, was um, regarding reliability. And all of the major news media, of course, were, were clustered at the top in terms of, re quote, reliability. And I said to the person, maybe this is a measure of consensus rather than accuracy. And, um, I, I was wondering if you might, given all of your history of protest and dissent, you might comment about the state of mainstream media where we see the same 
talking points repeated ad nauseum on where all we have to do is flip the channel and the same exact wording almost is repeated yes. and where people uh, who oppose are, are not allowed a voice. I absolutely agree. I like democracy now. That's I trust democracy now. Mm -hmm. And you can watch that online. Mm -hmm. uh, when I worked for Channel 4 in Milwaukee, uh, they have all of the stations on in the newsroom at the same time. And what they, what, they're, what they think they're supposed to do is cover all the same things. That's what they have instructions to do. Uh, occasionally, there'll be somebody who does something interesting. I should also say, um, for example, um, I did a, a drawn story about Foxconn at the time that Trump was uh, Trump and uh, Walker and all his all the cronies were saying how wonderful it would be. And that comic strip told the truth about the situation. You can see it on my blog spot and I'll put that in the notes too. It's art-as-activism.blogspot. And that comic strip was online um, in the online versions of The Shepherd and The Capital Times and a whole bunch of papers. And I was really surprised to have work like that in the liberal mainstream because it was really told the story about the corruption. Um, there's more openness to publishing real stories. And I have to say there are some really wonderful uh, reporters in Milwaukee who work with independent, um, independent uh, venues. There is, um, and of course I can't remember their names, um, but um, I will have to post them at a, for, at a future time when they pop into my head. But there's, yes, few and far between. I find I get a lot of my news posted from other people who are directly there uh, on Facebook and then referrals from friends. Okay. Thank you, um, thank you very much. Thank you, and are there other questions? Just raise your hand and wave or put up the little yellow ca cartoon hand. Uh, we have a couple of chat uh, invitations for art uh, exhibits when things open up again. So we're looking forward to contacting you then, uh, Susan. Any other comments or, or memories from people? Okay. So Dennis, Dennis, Janine, and Bruce have yes. questions. I got it. Thank you. Thank you. Dennis, please go ahead. Yes. Thank you, Susan. Uh, almost Hi. having flashbacks here to my uh, Berkeley days ah. um, when I was a graduate student there. My first full year was 1968. Um, but always have been so impressed with. Uh, uh, the kind of artwork that you're doing and that old saying about an image is worth a thousand words. So that combination of the image with a simple message or a slogan is so powerful. Uh, back then, Ron Cobb oh, was yeah. doing a lot of uh, cartoons about the environment. Um, he later on did the uh, cantina scene in Star Wars. But uh, your kind of art reminds me of that. And my question is, where can I get a hold of a Line 5 t-shirt? <laughs> oh, my God. Um, I will let you all know when they're available. There's, they are designed, and we've taken them to Silkscreen Place. There's a wonderful um, collaborative Silkscreen shop that's run through the IWW the internet, the uh, industrial workers of the world group. Um, 
in River West, but they're like overloaded. Um, there are people who are near the Mackinac Straits who are making the shirts and there will be more. So when they're available, they'll be for sale at the River West uh, food co-op, but they don't exist yet. Thanks. Right now there are buttons. And one of the things that I do is I curate buttons. And so I get art, I get designs from artists all over the world. I'll put out a call, for example, for, you know, a no a stop Enbridge, no line five, no line three, no mining. And there's a network of people who will send me designs. And I'm right now working on a new one. Um, I taught a class to, at the, at the uh, preschool on the Lower East Side of New York over Zoom together with one of the water activists, water protectors who was up at line three. And we inspired the people in the class, which was a political cartooning class to come up with designs for us. And they did spectacular work. So the posters are available. We make them available on a, on a Google, Google Drive, which is technology that I'm not completely comfortable with um, for people to copy and use. And so there are banners that are up, up uh, at Madeline Island and line three and line five that we've designed. Uh, we take full advantage of the capability of coming together without uh, being there in person and, and help each other out. But there will be shirts. Okay, I'm, I'm scrambling here to get your email address in the chat. And Janine had a comment and question, and please go ahead, Janine. Yeah, well, first of all, I'm pulling up one of the buttons. Oh, okay. Oh, good. Not That's one there. step back. A little smart. Um, well, so as always, I'm just blown away by how ready you are to step into places where you may not know everything about what's going on, but you learn, and you learn respectfully and quickly and in concert with others and create community with your artwork in the making of the art and when it gets displayed as well. Everything is about a greater good and bringing people together who might not always see eye to eye, but there's something that unifies all of us and it happens through your artwork through the messages that the artwork conveys and through the, the building process. It's just an amazing thing. And you're such a great example of how one person can truly make an incredible difference. You don't sit by the right side, you, you get right into the fray and you invite others to be there with you. And I think we all become brave because of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that. So thank you. That's my thank comment, you. thank you. Thank you, Janine. The learning process is really interesting. And Jeannie and you know how it all came about. So I, was, I made these fish um, puppets and I made them and they came out rather well. I was very happy with them. I first heard about fish puppets from the amazing artist, uh, David Solnit, who's in the Bay Area. And he's somebody who's tra who travels around the country just working with people to make art for, for use in the streets. S-O-L-N-I-T. And yes, he is the brother of the incredible writer, Rebecca Solnit, S-O-L-N-I-T, who I highly recommend. Now he started doing political artwork and banners and puppets back around 1979 um, with the Seabrook nuclear plant and way back. And he continues to just do and get people together to make artwork in the streets. Um, David, said, I met him because one of my children wanted to work with him, my younger son, when he was about 15 or 16. And he did, after I kind of checked the scene out, of course, being overprotective mom. And um, David was up at the Pacific Northwest where um, the tribes there were doing fish puppets to protect the salmon. 
And he gave me a photograph of this, God, like 19, must have been like 1970, no, sorry, 1996 or so. And gave me a picture of people holding up these salmon pu puppets. And it's, I still have it somewhere. And so that idea was planted in my head. And when it became appropriate, right around the time David came to Milwaukee and did a, work, did a workshop at River West Artists about making these flat puppets like the one I made of um, Tommy Thompson. Mm -hmm. And he's been an inspiration, it continues to be. But I made all these fish puppets and when I brought them to uh, events with Native Americans, people would say, where's the sturgeon? Where is the sturgeon? You've got to make a sturgeon. Mm -hmm. And they told, and I was told the sturgeon is the most important one to have because historically the sturgeon came swimming to sp up, up from Lake Michigan to spawn into the Wolf River, into the Menominee River. And they came up to spawn in April as soon as the water temperature started to rise. And it was the end of the season where all the stored food was running out. And it was called the starving time because the food was not available like it was to, to gather and to hunt uh, as the end of the winter came. And the sturgeon, of course, are these mammoth creatures. They're like six feet, eight feet, nine feet long. And they would come up the rivers and there would be food again. So the sturgeon holds a very important place in the lives of our tribes, the Menominee and the Ho-Chunk and the Ojibwe people, all the tribes of Wisconsin. So I started making sturgeon and the sturgeon are very popular. Absolutely, there are, yeah, there are grandfathers and grandmothers. Yeah. Um, Okay, I just want to let people know that I now put Susan's email in. I did it Thank you. wrong the last time, so now it's in there so everyone can see. So it's there. Um, Bruce, you have your little hand up. What would you like to add? Yeah, I wanted to ask in the very first image, what does walk like an Egyptian mean? That was uh, down <laughs> oh. at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, when we were in Madison, the uh, people were out in Tahrir Square in Cairo. Mm -hmm. And ah, okay. people in Cairo were ordering pizzas from Ian's for us. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. Uh, because of it being Madison and students being from all over the world, I believe that there was something like people from 40, 40, 50, 60 countries who were sending money to Ian's Pizza to, to feed us as we walked around the Capitol. And it was just an incredible moment of international solidarity like I have never, never felt. Hmm. Okay, thanks. Another question real quickly. Do you have... Um... Or have you ever done a traditional gallery presentation? We have a Unitarian gallery at, at our church. When we get together live again, could you do a, 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 a showing of, of your artwork? Oh, I certainly can. And um, back about mm, seven years ago, I was um, artist of the year for the ACLU. And so I had a show at their gallery, a retrospective Great. show. Great, okay. Um, I have artwork that's been, my artwork is in shows all the time somewhere. Good. And it's Thanks. easier to come do it in town. Yeah, I don't know yeah. who's in charge of our gallery now, but let's Maybe you talk about that when the time me. comes. Sure. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, BJ has a comment and a question and would like to, Yes. I'm in there. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, and Susan, thank you for your inspiring life and, and what you've been able to accomplish. 
Um, and for sharing this with us. I'm especially intrigued by the uh, traveling art show that had very little funds. And I thought, you know, so many times people say, oh, we have no money, we can't really do something like this. Right. And I would like to know more about how that came together. And I guess I'd like to know how we could learn about how to do that in case we have other causes that we want to do something like that. Well, it was, a it, it was something that was fitting the time as well. It was the time of the anti-globalization demonstrations. It was mm -hmm. the time of Occupy also. Oh. So in Nicholas w went to the anti-globalization demonstration in Seattle. David Solnit helped to organize the demonstration. People from all over came with their artwork. People were making giant puppets. Uh, people from Milwaukee went to Philadelphia to the Republican convention and had giant puppets that got arrested. Uh, the police thought they were Trojan horses and that there was some kind of insidious plan, but no, they were just puppets. Um, so that in, that in that period, people who were doing artwork um, from all over the US and Canada uh, found out who the other like-minded people were because of the internet. So we were able to find the different art collectives and community spaces, um, community centers, uh, galleries that were open to doing political work. So there in Canada, there are a lot of galleries that are, co that are collectively run. Um, there are galleries at colleges, there are galleries at various places. And we developed a network of people starting at that point. Nicholas okay. took the West Coast and I took the East Coast and we both took the Midwest and I took Canada. Um, and we made a list of people we knew. Um, we made a list of the artists whose work we liked between the two of us and we split the list down the middle. And I have to say that every single artist who we asked said yes to sending their artwork on the road with these unknown folks going to a variety of venues, uh, traveling by van by unknown people and they all said, yeah, this is really a great idea. And so we contacted different places we knew. And some of them are famous, like ABC No Rio, which is a gallery and community space on the Lower East Side of New York. Um, then we had academic folks. We had um, radical art historians who had access to galleries in Edmonton. We had... Um, uh, anarchist community center in Winnipeg. We had um, alternative galleries in Houston. Um, and we picked, we, we, we had all these various places. Nicholas drew a map of where, to, where it would go. And it was really easy to get people to take it from like New York to Philadelphia or to Boston. And um, it was fairly easy to go from Montreal to uh, to help. I'm thinking of to Montreal to Toronto. Oh. But then when it came to going from Montreal to Edmonton, to Winnipeg, to Edmonton, it got a little bit more difficult. And one of the, I don't even remember who it was, one of the groups, I think it was Winnipeg shipping it to Edmonton, put it on, packed it up, built boxes and put it on a train. <laughs> the place that had the biggest reception where hundreds and hundreds of people came was Winnipeg. Wow. And I never knew that much about Winnipeg. Um, so we made this map and it went, you know, north and then it went south and went across and it went up and then it came down across the border to Seattle and down the West Coast. 
and down to New Mexico. And it ended, it was going to go to, it went to Houston to something called the Art Car Museum. Um, and it was supposed to end, it ended four years later. It traveled for four years to 32 cities. Wow. Um, and it was all like, um, absolutely no funding. I mean, we had, we had frames donated by the generosity of people at the River West Artists Association. It started at River West Artists Association Gallery um, and on Frantney Street and it ended up on Holton because the ceiling fell in um, on the at the Frantney Street site <laughs> and at the old uh, tin shop on Frantney and Hour. And the group came together and got a storefront, knocked down the walls and erected new plaster walls at a gallery on Holton Street that no longer exists mm -hmm. with sledgehammers, put up walls to make, it, to make the gallery available for the art show to return. I mean, that's kind of River West and our community is just an amazing group of people. And it wasn't people who are necessarily sympathetic to the topics of the artwork at all either. It was people who just felt this obligation to keep the community together and to do it the right way. And so the show opened at the time of 9-11. Of and we worried at that point what the reaction would be to all this left, left wing artwork. And it became a place of respite for people who mm -hmm. didn't hate, didn't have, uh, didn't believe in war and violence and hate. And the show ended because it was supposed to, go, we were just tired of doing it after four years. The artwork was no longer new and it was supposed to end in New Orleans. And wouldn't you know that it didn't go to New Orleans and if it would have been, the hurricane would have ended the show. Oh my God. So it was a special time. Okay. And that's how we did it. Whoever had the show collected donations to get to the next place. They found someone to drive it most of the time in a minivan. It was made to 2D and it was made to pack up in a minivan. And it was also an invitation to each place that showed it to organize their own local show to go along with it. Mm -hmm. So I think the idea of it was just so inclusive that it was just a unique thing. Now, Nicholas thought I should write a book about it, but the way I am is that I, as you see, I'm like, whatever is happening right now draws me in. Mm -hmm. And the isolation for drawing comic strips is way too much for me. It takes, it took me from before Christmas till this week to do a 12 page comic strip for the next issue of World War III. And I worked on it six to eight hours a day that entire time because of wanting to be in um, you know, isolation because of COVID and the weather. And now I'm done. And the, the new comic strip that'll be out in the new issue of World War III is the history of street medics. It's about the how, thing, how people organized medical presence at demonstrations starting with the civil rights movement and the March on Selma and how it continued through the horrible events in Kenosha. Wow. Oh Thank my. you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Could I just ask a, br a hopefully a brief follow-up question? Yes. Would you ever be interested in uh, doing artwork to uh, help promote awareness of people with disabilities? Because um, we're a very much a, a, an excluded group in a lot of ways. Well, and it's there's a included, lot of education that needs it's, to be it's done. It's included, disabilities are included in the context of a bunch of my different stories. Ah. Um, hmm. I do things that are not specifically around an issue like disabilities. All of my work is to some degree autobiographical. Ah. And it's things I've done and places I've gone to and where 
I don't have to start cold doing research or telling somebody else's story. And in my autobiographical story, my brother who was blind since birth is in the story. And also mm. my family that suffered mental illness issues mm. is, uh, and, and the roots of it in, um, in genocide and how that mm. created anxiety and um, GI issues and other problems due to stress um, mm. is in that context. That's a lot. Thank you very much. Yeah. Woven, in, woven into your stories. Thank you right. so much, Susan. I am so sorry to be the one that says, I think we need to close. And <laughs> there are people who would really love to connect with you. Um, uh, Barbara Lee is, is chiming in saying she hopes to connect with you. If, if someone wants uh, uh, Susan's email, contact me. I'm in the UU directory, if that helps. And um, I will connect you with Susan's email. It's in the chat, but the chat doesn't hang around long. Yes, okay. Susan. And again, art-as-activism.blogspot. And you can see okay. lots of my artwork and all of my stories. Can you well, say that again? Yeah. <laughs> art, it, all lowercase, art, A-R-T, dash, as, A-S, dash, activism oh. dot blogspot. I grabbed it early. Now it's yeah, the yeah. title. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you so much. I just